Welcome to my ranking of all the films I've seen that came out in 1998. And I can now reveal I have seen 23 films from this particular year, and I'm going to be ranking them all today from worst to best. Quick reminder though, before we get into it, that the top two films today will go through to the eventual grand final of 100 films, where I will be declaring once and for all what the greatest film of all time is. So there's a lot on the line today, big stakes. So let's get into it, and I guess we'll start, as we always do, with the film that I consider to be my least favourite that came out in this particular year. Look away now, Child's Play fans. Yeah, I didn't expect this film to come bottom of its release year, but when I was writing these down on paper, it suddenly dawned on me that yes, this is actually my least favourite film that came out in 98. I watched all the Child's Play films in 2020 within quite a short time frame, and I was having fun with them by the time I got to this one, the fourth one. What's more, I'd been led to believe that this, is, this was one of the better ones, so I actually went out and bought a Blu-ray for this, even though I'd not been buying Blu-rays up until that point. And yes, yeah, Sod's Law, I didn't like it at all. This was an attempt to move the series into comedy, but not all the way into comedy, so there's like an awkward sort of balance going on here between comedy and horror, but the trouble is the film's nowhere near funny enough to qualify as a comedy, and it, it's certainly worth nothing as a horror. I think Seed of Chucky, which came after it, lent completely into the comedy and was much better as a result. This film is a really slow starting affair. We spend about 20 minutes with the girl doll character as she tortures a goth in a caravan and then once her and Chucky get together and they go on their little road trip, things pick up for a while and I kind of thought to myself at the time, okay, we're getting going here, but then it just kind of fades to nothing and the last... The last act, it feels like the ending to an episode of TV or something. So yeah, I wasn't impressed with Bride of Chucky. And as far as I'm concerned, that Blu-ray is effectively on death row. You know, I'll keep it, but when, if there comes a day when I run out of shelf room, that one will, will be walking the plank towards my dustbin. This is a comedy about a group of friends who are unemployed and they spend a lot of their time going bowling. It doesn't sound much, but I watched it years and years ago and I sort of remembered it being all right. I particularly remembered a scene where John Goodman goes to smash up somebody's car but he accidentally smashes up the car of the next door neighbour instead. That was really funny. So if you'd have asked me a year ago, what do you think of The Big Lebowski, I probably would have said, yeah, that, that's a pretty good film. But a few weeks ago, maybe a bit longer, one of the channels I'm subscribed to was doing a watch party for this and I thought to myself, oh, this is a good chance to revisit The Big Lebowski put it on Sky, and I didn't have the same experience at all. An hour passed, and I realised that I'd not really got anything out of it. I mean, there's still the great scene with the car, and there's one or two other good rants from John Goodman, but by and large, it, it just wasn't for me this time around anyway, so I, I don't know what happened there. I'm not really into comedies. I mean, if you've been following this series so far, you'll know that I tend to put <laughs> comedies in the bottom half of the ranking a lot of the time. I take my cinema art seriously, you know? I mean, I, do, you, do you really think I'm gonna be amused by a guy walking around with long hair, calls himself the dude? Nah. Oh, look at this, another comedy. I think I saw this back when I was a student. I watched quite a few films communally around about that time. I might have laughed a few more times watching this than I did The Big Lebowski, not that that's saying much. I do recall the part where the girl's hair sticks up on her head and isn't there a bit where a guy gets his dick trapped in his zipper when he's on a date? I mean, it's all adolescent humour, but it's harmless enough. I think the film gets a bit sickly sweet towards the end from what I remember. I, I mainly remember this film though for Cameron Diaz. I mean, this was the film that exploded her into the public conscience. I don't remember any of the male characters at all. I only remember Cameron. I don't think I disliked this film from memory, but I don't remember particularly liking it either. I think I would have saved myself a lot of hassle today if I'd have just made this an even top 20 instead of going the full hog and doing a top 23. This was one of Harrison Ford's lesser career choices. He's sort of playing an earthly version of Han Solo in this. He's a pilot, this character, and he's down in the dumps at the beginning of this story. He's a very cynical person. And then he meets Anne Hesch, I think, is the actress. She turns up at this tropical island with her douchebag boyfriend, played by David Schwimmer. 
and she goes off with Harrison Ford and they have this little adventure together. I think there are some modern day pirates after them or something. And at the end of the movie, they, they fly off and live happily ever after, leaving poor David Schwimmer to go home by himself, if I've got that right. <laughs> Around about this time, at the end of the 90s, all the actors who were in Friends were sort of trying to break out and make it in Hollywood with mixed results. Courtney Cox did all right, Jennifer Aniston did all right, the other four though, and this was probably David Schwimmer's big attempt at doing some big movie, you know, starring with Harrison Ford, but it just ends up becoming the Harrison Ford and Anne Hess show, as far as I can recall. So yeah, I don't think this film is worth much. I think it was sort of trying to be the 90s version of Romancing the Stone, but it's just not very good. This is another comedy, but I don't mind this one. I laughed quite a few times during this film. We're starting to get into the ones now that I have a modicum of respect for. So this is a UK film about a rugby team, and they're really awful at the start of the movie, but they get involved in this match, this competition or something, and at the end, they win with a try in the very last second of the match. You know, it's your typical sports film blueprint. And yeah, there are quite a few funny jokes in this. I watched it with a group of friends at the cinema. We'd actually turned up to watch Titanic, but that was sold out. So we just decided to go into the other screen and watch this random film that we'd never heard of. There was literally just us in this other screening. It, it, it was not a popular film, should, shall we say. So we turned up hoping for death and destruction on the Titanic and we ended up getting this light-hearted comedy. So I guess at least we didn't go home bitter and twisted. Halloween is my favourite horror franchise, but H2O is my least favourite film within that franchise. That's not a common opinion, by the way. Quite a lot of Halloween fans do like this film. I've even seen some people put it as high as number two on their personal Halloween rankings, but not for me. In fact, it's possible that the only reason I've even got it at 18th is out of some kind of blind loyalty to the series. If you want an example as to how stupid and loyal fandom is sometimes, I bought a Blu-ray for Halloween Kills the other day for £17, even though I was kind of lukewarm on the film and I saw it at the cinema, but you know what it's like when you're a fan of something and you've just got to complete your collection. I was literally sat on the Amazon.co.uk website the other day like a zombie going, must have Halloween kills, even though I didn't really like it. And next thing I knew, it was in my basket and getting bought. So getting back to H2O, I just find it a really dull film. The characters are like paper mache. I don't like Laurie Strode's alcoholism in this. I just think she would have gotten over it after 20 years. There's not much in the way of suspense and kills. The teenage characters are absolutely horrible in this. The school setting is completely wasted. It's such a by-the-numbers slasher, slasher film. It's painful, it really is. I don't understand why this film is so revered among Halloween fans. I really don't. I think this is a film that's sort of centered around The Three Musketeers, but it's not actually called The Three Musketeers. I could be wrong about that, but you know what? I don't check Wikipedia before I do these videos. I back myself, you know? I put money on myself to get things right. What I definitely do remember being in the film is Leonardo DiCaprio playing a guy who is freed from a dungeon near the start. When he was in this dungeon, he was forced to wear like a metal mask, hence the title, The Man in the Iron Mask. Okay, so it was an iron mask, not a metal mask. When they take this mask off, He's got like hair all over his face from where it was growing underneath the mask. It's kind of gross when you think about it. It's quite a cruel punishment. I mean, is being forced to live your life in a dungeon not punishment enough without being forced to wear a metal mask as well? I don't remember that much else about the film, in all honesty. It's quite a forgettable sort of piece, but it's very family friendly. It's the sort of thing that as a nine or ten year old, you'd be quite content to put onto the TV on a Sunday afternoon and it's not going to offend grandma too much. Lots of comedies in the ranking today, but this is a genuinely really good one. It's another UK effort. It was set in Scarborough, same town where St. Maud was set, much more my type of movie. Little Voice, though, is about a young woman who has genuine singing talent, enough to possibly go on and be as successful as someone like Adele, say, I don't know. But she doesn't actually want to sing, that's the problem. She'd much rather stay in Scarborough and raise pigeons with Ewan McGregor. But this guy called Ray Say comes along one day, who's like a music agent. He's played by Michael Caine, absolutely brilliant character this and the way Kane handles the, the role is absolutely magnificent. In fact the funniest part in the whole thing is when 
Kane gets up and does karaoke towards the end and he starts singing this Roy Orbison song. I think it's called It's Over, but he's just screaming the lyrics into the microphone. He's not even properly singing them because he's so upset that Little Voice, that's the main character's nickname, she doesn't want to go along with his, his scheme. And there's another funny moment as well when this agent from London comes up to see Little Voice, but she doesn't turn up and uh, Michael Caine's race just starts insulting him in the audience. He's like, Bunny Star Maker Morris, fuck off. Michael Caine is just fantastic in any role he does, especially in this film. He shines in this film. It, it's brilliant what he does. Uh, Jane Horrocks plays Little Voice, not really an out and out actress generally, but she does very well with this role. It's not often I really love a comedy, but the more I talk about this, the more I realize that actually this possibly could have come higher than 15 today. Very good film. Watch it if you've never seen it. This is a lethal weapon type cop buddy film where Jet Li and Chris Rock come together. They don't like each other at first. They're from completely different walks of life, but as, as they get involved with trying to take down some crime gang or another, they slowly start to appreciate what, what each other brings to the table. And by the end of the movie, they are really good friends. I saw this on TV once and I was really amused by it. I liked it so much that I thought to myself, you know what, I'm gonna buy the DVD for this. Now, this was 2002. And the reason why I can narrow it down to an exact year is because 2002 was when I started my DVD collection. And at the time I decided to buy Rush Hour, I only had three DVDs, that was it. I mean, I've got like hundreds now, but at the time I only had Night of the Living Dead, Demons, and a film called Traffic with Michael Douglas in it. That was it, three films. So I went to this video store one, one afternoon, took Rush Hour off the shelf, fully intending for it to be my fourth ever film in my DVD collection, took it to the counter, had my £10 in my hand, and the guy said that they didn't have the disc for it, and it was a mistake that the box was on the shelf. This turned into a bit of a sliding doors moment, because I never ended up buying the film again after that. I just went home, chalked it up to fate, and never ended up buying Rush Hour, never ended up watching it again. Kind of sad that, isn't it? It's a very sad and actually quite pointless story. It's a true story, but a very sad and pointless little story. This is a much more serious film. It's a Western set in Australia. It stars, I, I think, Guy Pearce and Ray Winston. Now, I could be completely wrong about that. I'm putting my knowledge to the test again, but it's a very good film, this. I really enjoyed it the one time I saw it. What I most remember about it, though, is not Pierce or Winston, but, but John Hurt. He plays a small role in this. He's only in two scenes, but he's brilliant. He plays like an aging bounty hunter who just randomly bumps into the main character in a bar. It's brilliant. It, it's the sort of film that just reminds you how great John Hurt was. But the film as a whole is absolutely worth seeing. And by the time I finished this, I, I kind of thought to myself, why can't there be more Westerns set in Australia? Possibly there are, and I just don't notice them. I used to react to the release of any Will Smith film with mostly disdain, but Enemy of the State is one of his better ones, actually, not just from the 90s, but from his, his whole career. This wasn't silly like Wild Wild West or Men in Black. It was, a, it was a good, serious, gritty thriller about a guy on the run from the government through no fault of his own. There are more famous actors in this film, actually, than you might remember. Uh, Gabrielle Byrne turns up as a cabbie who turns out to be more shady than we think at first. Tom Sizemore plays a gangster who ends up being tricked into firing at some government agents near the end, which results in his own death. I think the main government bad guy might be played by John Voight, uh, so there's another name, and it's just, it's just a very good film. The government have got all these like fancy satellites to help them track down Will Smith. So the whole film is a little bit like an early version of The Bourne Identity, just without the fancy car chases and, and all the kung fu and what have you. This is a thriller starring Matt Dillon, Nev Campbell and Denise Richards. It begins with an accusation of rape, but then the story turns out to be not what you thought it was. There are lots of twists in this film, actually, which is good for a while. It's very absorbing to watch. But I kind of felt that as it got towards the end, there were one too many twists, as if the film was trying to be the twistiest film of all time. And I kind of feel like 
by the time it got to the halfway point of this story, it should have just stuck with where it was at instead of continuing to try and come up with new twists. That's how I remember the film anyway. Although, having said that, the ending on a boat is very satisfying. The final kill did have me sort of nodding my head thinking, yeah, I kind of like that. So, yeah, this is an all right film, I suppose. I've, I've never gone back to it, but it is nice to remember that Nev Campbell has done at least one film other than Scream that is really good. I went to watch this at the cinema with a couple of friends of mine and we had a good time. I've never gone on to watch number two or number three, but from what I can recall, it's a good bit of fantasy action. Wesley Snipes runs around cutting up vampires by the score. I've heard that they're going to remake this, but have it be part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If they do that, I'll absolutely be interested in watching it because I do like the Marvel films. In fact, if it does become a Marvel film, I presume they're not going to use Wesley Snipes at this point. If they do make it a Marvel film, that might inspire me to go back and watch the original Blade trilogy. And remember, two of those films will be first time watches for me. Bizarrely, I think we've got these films on DVD. Now, I didn't buy them. I think my wife did. My wife's not really into films, but when I met her well over 10 years ago now, she had like a, a batch of DVDs that she owned. A lot of them were romantic comedies, but she had the Blade trilogy as well, strangely. I've never seen her watch them, but I, I know they're there. I've seen them from time to time. So if I do want to catch up on these films, I guess they are there for me to watch for free. Maybe I should do it. This is a film about a town which gets completely submerged by water, but we actually see this situation develop during the first half of the film. It's not like Waterworld where it's already happened prior to the movie starting. I don't think it's just because of rain that this situation occurs. I think some kind of dam bursts nearby or something. I don't think it's a global event. I think it's just this town. Christian Slater almost drowns in a jail cell from what I remember. So he's in it, Morgan Freeman. Mini Driver, back when she was still a thing. It's a good little thriller. Lots of threats pop up other than the water itself. So you've got looters, corrupt cops, uh, at least one rapist cop. And it, it's a fairly unpredictable film. It takes various twists and turns. And I think Morgan Freeman sails off into the sunset with some loot at the end, a bit like Fagin at the end of Oliver Twist. That The memory of that sort of amuses me. But this is a good little thriller, absolutely worth watching. It didn't make much of a splash at the time, no pun intended, but give it a shot if you've not seen it. The fourth and to date final Lethal Weapon film, that could still change, but for now it is the final one in the series and something of a return to form after the disappointing third film. I don't mind the third one, but it did drift a little bit too much into comedy for me. This one gets the balance back to how it was in the first two movies and there are some great moments in this one. The opening scene with the flamethrower guy in the street, that is so random, but it's, it's my favourite scene in, across the whole four films, I think. And Murtoch doing that chicken dance in, in his underpants is just absolutely legendary. And there's, there's another funny moment about halfway through the film where they start taking helium and they all start laughing and the truth starts coming out about various things. That's absolutely brilliant as well. And I like the final fight with Jet Li. It's just about believable that the two of them could take this guy on. I suspect in reality it still wouldn't be enough. I think you would need Chris Rock's character as well. I think possibly he should have been there. I think the three of them going at this guy... It, that would have been perfect, but as it is, it just about works. And all the family stuff you get to finish the film off is, is kind of sweet. And Joe Pesky's character, Leo Getz, he finally gets a bit of respect towards the end. It's a great ending to the series, this, what you get at the end. So it, it makes me slightly nervous that they're possibly planning a fifth film, but I, I guess I won't judge it until I see it. This was one of the first films I ever reviewed on the channel. I think it was like episode 14 or something. And I had intended on at least watching the rest of the, the series because the, I think there's about six or seven of these. There's like Ring 2, Ring vs. Grudge. The, there's all kinds of sequels and prequels and crossovers and stuff. But I lost interest a bit halfway through the second film, so I didn't go on with it. I'll say as well that I actually prefer the American version of this, which wouldn't come out until about 2002, 2003. I thought that was one of the most creepily effective films that I saw around about that period. And... I've got to say the Americans did really well with their remake on this one. Sometimes when a film gets remade, it's like, what's the point? You can just watch the foreign language version. But in this instance, yeah, the American one's really, really good. I actually don't think either one of the two versions is better than the other. I think it's, a, it's likely to be a case of whichever one you watch first 
will be the one for you. And in my case, I watched the American one first, so my heart is with that version because there are certain thrilling things that happen in the ring, which if as long as you don't know what's going to happen going into it, you'll find it absolutely amazing, I think, especially if you're a horror fan. But when you then come to the other version, you sort of know what to expect, even though obviously the script will be slightly different and the scares will be done in, in a slightly different way. But for me, I saw the American version first. That's the one for me. So when it comes to the Japanese version, I respect it, but it's not likely to be one that I'll go back to in the future. But hey, it's still made the top 10 today. This is a horror film along the lines of The Body Snatchers or The Thing. As high school horror films go, it's much better than Halloween H2O, which is also in this ranking. I've seen the movie twice. Neither of those viewings were recent, so my memory's struggling a little bit on this one. I just remember it being really good, really entertaining. Josh Hartnett's in it. I don't remember any of the other cast. One strange thing about this film, when I first watched it, when it got to the end credits, there's an Oasis song, Stay Young, and I was familiar with that song at the time, so I thought to myself, oh cool, they, they, they've put Stay Young on the, on the end credits, brilliant. And then I watched the film a second time, a couple of years later, and they had a completely different song on the end credits. I don't think I've ever seen that before with a movie, so I don't know what was going on there. They, they clearly did two different versions. Why? I don't know. What was wrong with stay young that they suddenly had to replace the song a couple of years later. I've tried to look for information on this online. I've typed in different song end credits, the faculty, and I can't find a thing. So I don't know if you're like some kind of die hard, the faculty fan, and you know more about this, please let me know. I'd be fascinated to hear it. The mileage you get out of this will largely depend on whether you're a fan of the TV show and I am personally. So I enjoyed the movie. That's why it's number six today. If you try and watch it without having seen the TV show, I don't know, I guess you could enjoy it. Because I, I know they tried a little bit to cater to the casual cinema go with this. They tried to make it accessible, but for maximum enjoyment, I think you've, you, you've got to have seen the TV show, really. I've watched the show since the 90s. Back then, I just tended to watch the occasional episode. But in the noughties, I really got into the X-Files. I borrowed my friend's VHS collector sets and watched every episode from start to finish. I think there's over 200 episodes in total. It took me a long time. And at some point after that, I bought my own DVD versions, but they don't really get watched anymore because if you want to get into this show, all the episodes from the entire run are available on Disney Plus and they're proper HD versions as well. So if I'm watching the X-Files now, I'll just watch it on Disney. I won't even bother getting my DVDs off the shelf. Plus, at one point, one of my dogs chewed up the season two box. So on my shelf now, it just looks a bit crap. Like season one, season two, horribly chewed up, and then all the other seasons. And I think one of my later seasons got scratched as well. So I, I, honestly, I might as well just chuck that collection of DVDs away at this point. The actual film itself is definitely more high budget than a, a standard episode of The X-Files, though it's only really noticeable, I think, in the last sort of 20, 30 minutes when Mulder and Scully go into this kind of underground alien city or something. I've not seen it for quite some time. I do know that it follows on from season five. I think they did a shortened version of season five because they knew that they were going to be doing the movie. And I think it was reasonably successful. They did a second one at some point later on. But, but yeah, I mean, it all comes down to whether you are interested in the X-Files, ultimately. This is a film about an absolutely massive sea creature that's sort of like a kraken, but even bigger than what you would picture a kraken to be. And it terrorises this ocean liner at the start of this film. Its tentacles are so long, it can just get anywhere inside an ocean liner. It's brutally efficient. And then this other vessel comes along, discovers the ocean liner, basically abandoned because everybody's dead on board. And there's a bunch of crook crooks on this boat and some good guys as well. They get onto the ocean liner and then once they realise what the gist is, they've got to survive the creature as well. But... This thing is just incredibly hard to overcome. Characters die off very quickly in this film and in very gory ways. It's got a nice atmosphere though. Treat Williams plays the lead. He is absolutely a star. I don't know why he didn't have a bigger career. Famke Janssen is in this film. This would have been one of her first films post-Goldeneye. She still lo looks in her absolute prime 
and the film's got a very funny ending as well, which I won't spoil. I'm really into my aquatic horror films, and this one really does the business for me. Northern Monkeys, Southern Fairies. This is one of the best crime films I've ever seen, and it's funny as well. One of Jason Statham's first films, Vinnie Jones in it. I mean, as somebody who followed Vinnie Jones' football career before this film, and as someone who knew what he was like playing football, to see him playing a debt collector, it was just the most amazing thing. It absolutely made sense. It's so clever how the various different factions in this film are, are sort of interconnected and none of them realise it for the longest time. And it's got to be one of the most quotable films I have ever seen in my life. Golf is a waste of a good walk. Winston Churchill said that. I say it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. My favourite character though is probably the like the gang gang boss who's got like a massive afro. Some of the stuff he comes out with, I think he says at one point, if you lie to me, Nick, I'll kill you. You tell me the truth, but I think you're lying. I'll kill you. In fact, you're going to have to work bloody hard to stay alive, Nick. I think in the same scene, he comes out with another perler. He's talking about a cocaine shipment and on the possibility of it going badly wrong or something, he says, if the cream turns out to be sour, I ain't the type of pussy who's going to drink it. If you saw my 97 rankings video, you'll know that the original film in this trilogy has already made it through to the grand final. This sequel almost made it to the final as well. Just missed out, and I think that's right. It is a little bit down on the first film in terms of quality, but I still love it. It's got a great atmosphere. Most of the film takes place in some kind of abandoned holiday resort. It's very spooky. I think uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt as the lead in this was a lot more comfortable doing this kind of role second time around, whereas in the first film she was a little bit dorky and awkward at times. But I just love this trilogy. I even like the third film, which nobody else likes apart from me. So this is the last we'll be seeing of this film, but once we get to the grand final, we will be seeing the original again. I know what you did last summer. But for now, let's get on and find out which two films today will be going through to the grand final, starting with this one at number two. So this is predominantly a Robert De Niro helmed thriller. It's not one of his most well known, I guess, but you know what, some of De Niro's most famous works are things that I can't really get into, things like Taxi Driver and The Deer Hunter, but I've always liked this one. And again, I said earlier that Enemy of the State is like an early version of The Bourne Identity, if you look at, it, look at it from a certain viewpoint. So is this film, at least if you look at all the car chases in Ronan and the Euro thriller feel to it. There are some other famous actors in this, Jean Reno, Sean Bean's in it. His role is really bizarre. I've never been able to puzzle out why Sean Bean is in this film, but he does come out with one line which has always stuck with me. So it's just after a gunfight and blood has been spilled and in reference to that blood, Sean Bean says something about strawberry jam. He says something like, oh, we spilled a bit of short strawberry jam. I can't remember the exact line. It's probably not quite that, but it's, it's in that ballpark. And sometimes when I'm playing Call of Duty or something, I'll just randomly hear Sean Bean in my head going, oh, we spilled a bit of strawberry jam. Yeah, I know I'm a bit of a weirdo, but just, just go with it. So Ronan is a cracking film. You've never seen it absolutely check it out. It's It's got a very unpredictable script. You just don't know within this gang that De Niro gets involved with who's on a level, who might be betraying them. It's a really, really fun effort. So this is my number one for 98. Saving Private Ryan is surely one of the best war films ever made. I was excited to see this from the minute that I started reading about it in the newspapers. And when I finally did see it, it did not disappoint. This is an absolutely epic, amazingly good war film and I think the first 20-30 minutes is possibly the best thing about it. There are things that happen in Schindler's List which really hit you when you realise that these monst monstrosities actually did happen during World War II. You get something else just like that at the start of Saving Private Ryan. I mean imagine how horrible it must have been to get called up for war, do all your training, cross the channel, land on this beach and then the door to the boat opens and you just start getting gunned down and you didn't even have a chance. It must have been absolutely horrible for those guys and I think it's even in the scripts as well. Somebody gets on the beach and just shouts out, give us a goddamn chance or something and, and you actually feel for the guy. 
You've got another guy lying on the beach with his guts hanging out, calling for his mum. It's such an effectively harrowing sequence. And you get a nice end to it, which is weird, I guess, because some of them do make it up to the bunkers and they do take out the Germans. They're shooting them, burning them and stuff. So you sort of get a happy end to the whole action sequence. But yeah, it's one of the most incredible starts to a film I've ever seen. And I think most of the rest of the film after that point is fictional. And the film could have gone downhill after that point, but it doesn't. You, you get to follow Tom Hanks' character as he leads a band of merry men across country, and then you get this incredible battle at the end. There's one other bit, though, that makes me sad as well, which is when one of the main characters has his own knife turned against him, and this German just slowly pushes it down into this guy's heart, and all the time this guy's sort of whimpering and begging for his life. The way it's filmed, it, it really makes me sad when I'm watching that part, but... On the whole, absolutely love this film. I think it's just an amazing war film, well worthy of being my number one today, and we'll see it in the grand final further down the line. Right, so that brings us to the end of the rankings. There is one more question left to ask. I've got quite a few for this year, actually. I've got five, which is more than I normally have. I need to get off my arse and watch them, really. So one of them is a film called Spear. Another one, US Marshals, the sequel to The Fugitive. Species 2, quite enjoyed the first one. Never got around to watching the second one. I should. Soldier, a film with Kurt Russell in it. And Vampires, uh, one of John Carpenter's later films, which apparently is all right, so I need to watch that. So yeah, quite a few films there. Um, I'm, I'm really going to have to watch those at some point. So that brings us to the end of today's video. That was my favourite films from 1998. So we have Ronan and Saving Private Ryan going through to the grand final. Join me soon where I will be doing a similar rankings for 1999. Until next time, cheerio.